Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is talking again about the poles. We're going to be looking at the epic of polar history in general and humanity's records in whole. All of humanity's records of polar exploration and navigation. You know, the mainstream media makes it out as though these things, these places have been fully charted and mapped and and completely recorded every in, in every minute detail. That uh, polar exploration was done hundreds of years ago and that there's nothing to see there anymore. There's no purpose in going there. I think anybody who understands about the flat earth knows that there's much more to the poles than that. And so we're going to have a much more in-depth look into the poles. So we're going to begin here with polar exploration and the race for the North Pole. Roll them. It was a race that had few rules. Its competitors, fewer scruples. Some men would lie, cheat, and steal to win. Others would sacrifice their own lives and those of their companions. For what? To be the first to plant a flag on two empty stretches of ice. This is the story of the race for the North and South Poles. And so we already have them admitting to murder to reach the Poles and all types of skullduggery. Few unexplored realms on Earth. Among them were two imaginary points surrounded by hundreds of miles of ice and snow. The and South Fake Pole. CGI. It's an imaginary spot, but there was a spot to be reached. And once you reached it, then nobody else it's could reach it. It's an imaginary spot. And wait, South wait, 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 wait. It's an imaginary spot, but there was a spot to be reached. And once you reached it, then nobody else could it's reach it It's an imaginary first. spot. It's not imaginary at all. It's the center of the Earth, the North Pole. And the South Pole is the gigantic ice, perpendicular ice barrier that holds in the oceans. These frozen all realms right. summoned a select group of men, <laughs> determined to test themselves against nature. Oh, Seeking that's why they went, right? And immortality. Their names resounded in the press like modern day rock stars. Peary, Cook, Scott, Amundsen. Look at the ice wall. In order to survive, they had to fight not only the elements, but their own inner demons. In order to win, they had to risk their very lives. But again, I'm going to pause it here. Again, they show flat water. They show flat, a flat horizon, no mountains and water. So if we back it up here and look again at what they show us that's supposed to, at this, this wall here, this is obviously the South Pole. But they use this image when they're talking about the North Pole. Okay, so they, they're giving us the idea that the North Pole is flat and up on some sort of a plateau. Or that it's flat and, and that there's no mountains there. There's just nothing to see there. And they also, you'll see this repeatedly as we carry on, they constantly make it out as though the North Pole is so inhospitable that humans can't survive there and that you'll be killed if you try to go there. Don't possibly try to go there because you'll be killed. This is what they ingrained to us with these shows. You'll see this as we carry on. Commander Robert E. Peary and his support teams picked their way through shifting ice in his latest effort to reach the North Pole. Each night they dined on the same meal of pemmican, 
a concoction of dried meat, fat, and raisins. Each morning, they oh, struck so harsh. and labored 10 hours to cover 10 miles. Through all of this, Don't go the there. same fear tormented the famous explorer. Peary knew that at the age of 52, this was certainly his last chance to realize his quest. Time was not the only enemy. Peary's polar rival, Dr. Frederick Cook, had quietly sent word to his supporters that he uh -oh. would attempt to reach the North Pole first. Peary seethed. He hadn't expected a race for the pole. He believed it was his prize, and conquering it, his destiny. Peary had no use for anybody who he saw as a rival, and they were all rivals if they were seeking the North Pole or anything like it. Okay, so I'm pausing here again. We, we've just heard a little bit about Peary. So now that we know about the pole, and we've seen some of the other documentaries that I've shown you guys about the history of the pole, and what you'll know, you'll notice is that all of these explorers are funded completely by the Royal Society. Uh, and also the National Geographic Society, which is really just another extension of the Royal Society. And isn't it amazing how National Geographic has made itself into such a, a staple of science and of wholesome family science in in North America when really it's just a a magazine pushed down from the Royal Society. And it pushes evolution and the heliocentric model in every possible way. So what what he, they're talking about here is the the uh, the fight, the feud between these different explorers. But in reality, we know that they were all working for the society. So but they they openly admit to being murderers and underhanded using underhanded tactics right away. But so what We'll get to some more points here. The, the other thing is that they make it out as though you can't go there, it's impossible, you'll die. As though no human habitation is possible. But we know the Eskimos are up there continually and live there and have lived there for thousands of years. All right, Robert let's carry on. Edwin Peary took his first breath on May 6th, 1856 in the Allegheny Mountains of Pennsylvania. His father died when he was barely three years old, leaving the boy nicknamed Bertie in the care of his doting mother. She had raised him in a very girlish fashion for the first six or seven years of his life, and he would often come home uh, with his um, clothing torn, uh, having been in fights because he'd had to uh, assert himself in order to prove that he was really a little boy and not a little girl. Like most boys of the time, Peary enjoyed reading stories of Arctic adventures and polar bear hunts. He finally saw the Arctic with his own eyes while visiting southern Greenland in 1886. It was here, while on leave from his job as a civil engineer with the U.S. Navy, that the 30-year-old lieutenant began to design his own destiny. The North wait, wait, wait. So he already has his commission at 30 years. But he's a poor little boy. Since the dawn of civilization, it was a mystery that had intrigued all manner of men. Vikings were the first to venture into the forbidding north. But an impenetrable pack of ice pushed them back. Generation upon generation of adventurers followed in their wake. More CGI BS. By this is interesting. Look at this ring the around the north pole. Reached by man, was still 400 miles shy of the pole. Now, Robert Peary dreamt of adding his name to the See, roster he's of Arctic more Pole. worried about sewing cool little pockets into his this latest pants. Peary was about to meet another American who would play a leading role in this polar contest. Dr. Frederick Cook. Dr. Cook was a man unknown. People were very divided about who he was. 
His enemies said he was nothing but a cheap fake. And his friends said that he had never had a bad day in his life until he got mixed up with Robert E. Peary. Frederick Albert Cook was never a stranger to adversity. By age 23, this resourceful son of German immigrants had worked his way through medical school by selling milk. That same year, he lost his wife and newborn baby due to complications from childbirth. The grieving doctor filled his days reading Arctic explorations by the famous American explorer, Elisha Kent Kane. He had a devouring ambition to go there. And he read an advertisement in a newspaper in New York that had been placed there by Peary asking for a surgeon for his first North Greenland expedition. Aha, this is what he wanted. Cook and Peary met for the first time in Philadelphia in the spring of 1891. The doctor impressed Peary as the kind of man he sought for his mission. Peary didn't really want any rivals on this expedition. So he looked for people who were enthusiasts, but amateurs. He had an interview with Dr. Cook and accepted him that day to be the expedition's physician. The stage was set. In the coming years, Cook and Peary's ambitions would clash in a bitter race for the North The North Pole. By the age of 30, Lieutenant Robert E. Peary had chosen this hostile realm of ice and snow as his sure road to fame and fortune. In July of 1891, the civil engineer obtained a two-year leave from the Navy and headed north as leader of an exploratory expedition. As his ship kite encountered sea ice, Peary was finally entering the Arctic of his boyhood dreams. After four weeks sailing, Peary and his six-member team disembarked to a rocky shore in northern Greenland. The area was inhabited solely by native Inuit. The expedition was already making headlines back home. Josephine, Peary's wife of two years, had accompanied him north, causing a newspaper sensation. The press was divided between uh extolling her for being so brave and loyal to her husband and excoriating Peary for even suggesting taking her along to what they called the icy Sahara. That was no place for a woman, according to the 19th century. Josephine shared a wood cabin measuring only 22 by 12 feet with the six male members of the expedition. This would be their living quarters for a year. Peary and Cook worked well together in the crisp chill of northern Greenland. Cook let his hair grow long and wore furs loosely in the Inuit fashion, which kept an insulating layer of warm air near the skin. In May of the following year, Peary set out northward over the ice cap. Here, his journey to the pole truly began. When you're on that glacier, you can literally only see three things, and that is an infinite amount of ice, an infinite amount of sky, and uh, sunshine. That's it. There's nothing else to be seen. I think he was fascinated by that. Peary traveled 500 miles before dwindling supplies forced him to turn back. He had made no real inroads to the pole. Still, he did claim at least one important discovery. He charted a channel of water previously undiscovered. Peary speculated that it formed the northern boundary of Greenland. Peary Channel, it was on the maps for some time until people got there and found there was no channel. He had either seen something or thought he saw something or he had invented something. My feeling is that his ambition was such that, you see, he had to bring back something. For every trip he made, he had to bring back a triumph so that he could get money for the next trip. Peary returned to the States and launched a lucrative lecture tour. As his fame grew, he began planning a second